Broadway is grand indeed, my friends. Oh, this is your old pal Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I do love and I miss the theater. I miss going in with a bunch of middle-aged and older people who all have body odor, who are all just, you know, a few steps away from the grave, and they're catching two, two and a half hours of joy by talented people sharing genius and creativity with themselves, and then going out into the night and doing other horrible things. But, oh, there's no Broadway right now. It's killing me. However, we're going to talk right now to a person who knows a whole lot more about Broadway than you and me and everybody watching combined. He has been a publicist, a press agent for Broadway shows since 1983. His, his first show was the Flying Karamazov Brothers. And since then, he has worked on such productions as Leader of the Pack, Big River, A Christmas Story, uh, the, the recent uh, rock musical Be More Chill. He's also done concerts with really famous singers. And now... It's very difficult. It's difficult times for all of us. Not only is Broadway at the moment kind of in a sleeping beauty state, or what was it, Snow White, more, more Snow Whitey kind of a state, mm -hmm. but uh, he's trying to keep his business going and he's dealing with COVID, which apparently he has. So, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please welcome to the neighborhood the ailing but wonderful Keith Sherman. Shalom, Keith. Good morning, Rabbi. I love speaking with the rabbi on his That's right. So, Keith, are you uh, are you a Yidlach? Are you one of the tribe? I think I am. This is this is why God saved you, and you didn't die last week. He's he's saving you for better things. <laughs> that could be. That's a good reason. Right? There's probably. I'll bet there's another uh, somewhere in a year or two. There'll be another Fiddler on the Roof production, and so he's saving you to work on that, or either that or the Rothschilds, one of the two. But listen, I was very, very lucky. I had a mild case. So many people have it much worse than I with these breathing problems, and I basically had a terrible flu for two weeks. Oh, oh. How did you... Now, first of all, you were diagnosed with COVID. You, you don't think you just had a flu. You know you had COVID? Well, my husband is the medical director for two nursing homes, and mm. one day he came home and... The, uh, I actually tested negative, but then a few days later, I had all the symptoms of the, except the bad one. You know, I could breathe. Breathing, one. yeah. But the chills and the fever and the cough and the, and the night sweats, and, yeah. and it was as bad as it could be for, you know, 10 days or so. And then, thank goodness, I recovered. Thank you. So, so you figured, did you get tested again, or you just figure you came down with COVID after you tested negative? Get tested. Yeah, and my God, most people can't get tested. Once. I know, I know, I know. Believe um, me, yeah. Fortunately, I just showed up to facilities without an appointment in a car, and they said just go through. Mm. So, but it didn't matter. I mean, I was negative on a Wednesday, but Sunday I had all the symptoms. It was pretty awful. I can imagine. So, and there was nothing to. Do. I mean, you, thank God you're you're married to a medical person. Yeah. And, and and by the way, we're very excited about this because the producer, the, the the creator of this program, Dave, is married to a gerontologist, someone who works with older people. So your husband and she would have a lot that's to talk. What my, that's what he does. That's, that's his job. He's the medical director for two nursing homes. Wow. And yeah. my goodness, right now there's just, well, we all know the need. We all know what's going on. It's as terrible as it could be right now. Well, here's the deal. Does he come home and tell you so many people died today or are just, they're, they're sick, but they're okay? How's his nursing home doing? Actually, all of that. Hmm. Um, it, it, it's as terrible as one could imagine. You know, you're watching television or listening to the radio. Hmm. And these numbers are frightening. Personally, I had a friend. I didn't even know he was sick. And I got an email from his office saying he had passed away that day. And I got a, a, a text from a friend of mine whose 92-year-old grandfather passed away. Well, maybe you know, come on, 92, let's face it, a, a gust of wind can come also not. <laughs> right, okay, he may have lived his whole life, but still, I mean, this person's grandfather. And young okay, people yeah. are not immune to this, this disease. I mean, it's, you know, it, it affects human beings. 
and it affects of all different age groups. That's the weird part. They're still trying to figure out why 30-year-olds are dying, 80-year-olds are dying, you know, it, 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 and some people get it and are just carriers and are completely asymptomatic, and other people like you have it for two weeks, but thank God you get over it and you don't get the worst of it. But was there any, yeah, sorry. Right. But you know, we're so young in this whole process. It just, this thing just emerged a few months ago. And while every country, it seems, on the face of the earth is researching and they have their top scientists looking at the thing, there still isn't enough information. We're just right in the eye of the storm. And yeah. it's, you know, it's a terrible moment. It's unprecedented in our society. Well, in, in a way it is. I'm, yeah, sorry. I'm an optimist. I'm an optimistic person. And as difficult as it is, you know, we've all... Many of us have gone through things like 9-11, through the AIDS crisis, through hurricanes, blackouts. I remember as a boy, my grandparents telling me about handling polio. And, wow. And their, and their friends dropping, like, what's happening today? Oh, you're, uh, you're telling me, I mean, three weeks ago, I had a canker sore on, on my lip, and it was so painful. Oh, my God. God, and you know, people want to tell me about being in, in Auschwitz and Dachau. They did not have this cankasaur. I've got to tell you. You know, God bless you in that perspective because it's with humor that we're going to be able to get through this terrible moment in our lives. Who's choking? It was painful as hell. We need to laugh. Make us laugh. I'm trying. God knows I'm trying, ladies and gentlemen. No, we're talking. <laughs> No, but how are you feeling now? Are you completely, thank uh, God willing, healthy at this point? Well, yesterday I made a raspberry shortcake. So, Ooh. I mean, I think that's a good sign. It is. It is a good sign. But can anybody besides you eat it? Is it safer like your husband to eat? <laughs> I'm saying, no, that's no. not actually a joke. I'm wondering, is it? There's, there's yeah. nobody else here. You know, it's just, and the dog, but we don't give it to Murphy. Oh, I, I would hope not. That's, that's, that's a mercy in itself. But your husband has stayed healthy, even though he's the one surrounded yeah. by old people dying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's back to himself, and he, he started to go to work after nearly three weeks. Because uh, he was caring he was for you. working every day. I mean, his yeah. phone started at 7 in the morning, and yeah. it was going till 11 at night with nurses, with doctors, with Zoom meetings and conference calls. And, you know, uh, it's... It's it's a moment in our in our lives. Well, let me what ask I what do, is what is he doing to pro sorry no, I want what is he doing to protect himself? Because I would like to mimic whatever his behaviors are, where he's not catching it. Well, at the moment, conventional wisdom, and we really don't know enough, says that if you had it, you've got an, a, an immunity right. for the moment. But like the flu, it, it could mutate. So maybe next hmm. year. Like every year we get a flu shot, yes. which I don't understand the, the, the chemistry of it, but it's slightly different than the one that we've had in the previous yeah. year because the chemical composition of the biological composition of the virus changes. So this may happen, but for the moment, it seems to be somewhat uniform around the globe. Uh, but he's, he's had it now. so I'm Oh, he, oh you didn't tell me he had it. I didn't realize he, all, he had caught it too. Oh, well, it started with him. One oh. of his patients in one of his facilities was sent to a hospital. Oh. And when he came back to the facility, he was positive. Sure. Then the Department of Health came in the next day, and six members of the staff also tested positive. I mean, it's a very contagious thing. So were his symptoms as bad as yours? Was he laid up for two weeks and blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Oh, he oh. He had a little worse than I did. Mine was even mild. I mean, Come just back. last. Huh. So let me, let me, you know, as a married person, I've been married for, uh, for many years to my darling and uh, lovely wife, Miriam Libby. Uh, we have 27 and a half beautiful children who, thank God, are, are, are healthy at the moment. But who's the worst patient? Who's the more whiny? Who's the more kvetchy? You oh, or your husband? Me. I'm a terrible patient. Uh, really? I'm a terrible patient. Yeah. But, you know, having led, we're, we're together now. Wait, how long? How long are you together? I missed that. 33-11 years. We were married on the day of our 22nd anniversary. So that's a good thing. Okay, wow, that is... Uh, how did you meet your husband, by the way? Uh, we met at the gym at the Paris Health Club at, on the Upper West Side back in the 
late 80s, 1986. Just working out one day after work. And, and were your parents thrilled that you found a Jewish doctor to marry? Oh my God, my mother got free blood thinning medicine. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any spare, you know, I feel sometimes I wake up, I feel my blood is very thick. I, you know, I, I'm very sludgy. I can barely get out of bed. I could use a little of that, uh, that blood thing, ladies and gentlemen. But, but, you know, we've been talking so much about this damn disease. We have Keith Sherman on the phone who has been, you know, you've been married 33 years. How long ago did you start in the theater? Oh, my God. Well, my college, one of my college roommates grew up in New Rochelle, and his English teacher was the fellow that founded the Roundabout Theater. Mm. Today is this very important theater company with several Broadway theaters. But back in the late 70s, uh, there were two theaters. One was under a supermarket on 26th Street between 8th and 9th. And the other theater on 23rd is now the School of Visual Arts uh, oh. movie theater. But back then, we were, you know, doing uh, Shakespeare and Pirandello and Shaw. And we did a lot of dance. And I would basically rip tickets. I would go for coffee. I was an intern before they were called internships. Mm -hmm. And one day, the boss came up to me and he said, what do you want to, what are you doing when you graduate college? I said, I guess I'll find a job. He said, how would you like to be our marketing director? I said, sure. Mm -hmm. So that was my first job. When handling the roundabout theater company and it lasted for about a year till one day a printer because i was the marketing guy uh we owed two hundred dollars to this man and the theater was broken they hadn't paid him yeah. so i came i was walking into the theater one day and he beat me up in the lobby he, he... blood dripping from my face what the f what <laughs> <laughs> oh so my I god decided, hmm, maybe i should find another job now Holy, he beat you. Did you, wait, 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 stop right, did you press charges? No, no, you know, I mean, I was just a kid. I was 20-something years old. So I said, I'm going to find a new job now. So that, that, I lasted for a year at the roundabout. Wow. Um, and well, then I you owe Todd Haynes a punch in the nose, by the way. That was meant for him. Well, this is years before Todd was even involved. Or was it Gene Feist? Who, who was the original guy there? Who? Oh my God, listen to you. You knew. Gene, Gene Feist and Michael Fried. Michael, oh, I didn't even remember that. But okay, yeah, so so you you should punch, and I think they're dead. So open their coffin and, and punch them in the nose because you owe them one, for God's sakes. It's all right. You, it's, know, you, get, you let it go. From that right now. But so you. Great. Yeah. I found a job with one of the theater's leading press agents, and I, I was his assistant. I was 22. Um, and my first job was working on the Sherlock Holmes play called The Crucifer of Blood that Glenn Close was the star of with Paxton Whitehead. Oh, I love Paxton Whitehead. He said, oh, what a fabulous, I mean, not that Glenn Close was, is uh, uh, nothing a Kaddish, but I'm saying, oh, Paxton Whitehead, what a, what a fabulous. What an amazing actor. So, and then we did a play with Rex Harrison and Claudette Colbert. All right, stop right there. Stop right there. If you are promoting a play that starred Rex Harrison, a, a world-renowned, apparently, asshole. You must have some stories. You must have some behavior stories about Rex Harrison. Go. Uh, well, this was, I, I was just a little assistant. But, you know, I didn't have that experience. I oh. Mean, in this particular production, he was with Claudette Colbert and George Rose. Oh. Three-hander. And apparently they all got on rather well. Oh. The show lasted for a, a season. It was called Aren't We All? I mean, three great leading men and women. I mean, three great stars of the theater. Yeah. Doing a cream puff of a play. I mean, it was a delicious experience. Oh. I got to hang out with all of them, and I started to learn my craft. Well, what was, how was it different? Like, you had to publicize, you had to promote a play back in 1983, let's say, that Aren't We All was different back then from the way you promote and publicize a play today? Oh, very different. The whole media landscape has shifted. I mean, quite substantially. Something called social media has presented itself. Never heard of it. Yeah. No, but, but let's say, what would be a typical day back in the mid-early 1980s of publicizing this big play with these great stars? If you didn't have so, how would you do it? Oh, my God. Well, my job, I was typing press lists on carpet paper. Wow. I mean, that was my gig. 
gig. How glamorous is that? Well, I, I like I Carmen Paper. Run, yeah. And I had to run to stage doors and drop memos off with stage doormen for for the for the stars, setting up their interviews for the next day. Yeah, I guarantee you, if, yeah, if Moses and God had had carbon paper back in the day, there would have been more than one set of tablets of the Ten Commandments. They would have kept a spare and elsewhere just in case. You know, it's like he's carrying these Ten Commandments, but in a drawer somewhere, he's got the carbon copy. You know, in case people forget number nine or something. Everybody forgets Listen, number nine. I have a feeling most of your listeners don't even know what the hell carbon paper is. No, most of my <laughs> know carbon paper. Maybe, maybe some of them do, you know. My, my um, listeners remember mimeograph machines, for God's sake. Okay. It's before cell phones, people. Yeah. You know, it's before cell phones. So when you, you would type up a press li listing, so these were the people, a press list are the critics and the other media people that you would invite to see a show, to review it, to talk about it, to do preview pieces on these productions. Am I correct? Absolutely right. Absolutely. But I was the kid in the office, you know, I did all the grunt work. Okay. You know, I answered the phone and, you know, whatever needed to get done. Well, this is important. This is how you learn. This is, you have to be the this newbie. Is how you learn. Yeah. But if you're smart, you're, you act like a sponge and you absorb what's going on around you. And I was blessed with working with some very senior people who were very experienced and very well respected. And, and I learned. You know, I kept my mouth shut and my ears open. Well, what, what are the kinds of things that you didn't know in your first week or month working there that you kind of learned a year or two or three into the business? Something that um, you didn't expect or something that, oh, this makes a lot of sense. You know, that's a great question. Thank you. But it, it goes beyond any, any element of business. It's about life. You learn how to handle people, mm. you know, because you're working with some very fancy people people who, you know, have healthy egos, people who are great artists or great businessmen and women. And, you know, you learn how to handle them, how you can move things along, how how the world works on, you know, on, on, on a more complex level than having grown up in New Jersey with my father running a furniture store and my grandparents running bakeries. Ooh. You know, you're dealing with fancy people. And that, that appealed to me. I found that incredibly exciting because I fell in love with the theater at a very, very early age. All right, then that leads to the question, what is the first show that you, that made a big, either that you fir first went to or made a big impression on you at the theater that oh, changed I, your, yeah. I, I have that nailed. It was 1776. Oh. I was 14. I saw it from the last row of the balcony. That was playing at the 46th Street Theater, which is where Hamilton is playing today. And I have a very clear memory of, of that show. If you, if you know it, the last moment, the scrim comes down and the light shifts. And there's the Declaration of Independence, which has been sung about now for two hours. And this 14-year-old kid just had this jolt of electricity shoot through his entire body. I started shaking and sweating during the, the curtain call. You had COVID. And I, sat, I sat down and I was exhausted. I said, what the hell is that? And how do I feel it again? And how did you feel it again? What was the next show that gave you that same kind of feeling? Oh my God! Remember seeing butterflies are free oh. with my high school English class. So I grew up in Jersey, and I was the kind of a kid where the bus to New York, which was forty-five minutes from the town where I grew up, and stopped in front of my high school. I would cut classes on a Wednesday afternoon, jump on the bus, buy a standing room ticket to a show, mm -hmm. and then be home before my family knew what I had done. I saw hair that way. Wow. Wow. And you saw all kinds of uh, hairs all over their naked bodies. I'm sure they were thrilled to, <laughs> to know that, if you think about it. Absolutely right. And Absolutely. let me ask you, when you bought a stand, standing room only a ticket to shows like Hair in the, the late 60s, early 70s, was that ticket like a dollar fifty? It sent me back eight bucks, I oh, remember. Really? Eight dollars? That actually sounds pretty, pretty hefty for that time. Doesn't it? Yeah, making that up. I don't know. Yeah, that because yeah, TDF was was charging maybe twelve in the in the eighties. One of your outrageous prices. So one of the shows I handled was 
the King and I during Yul Brenner's last Broadway run. Yeah. This was in the early 80s. It was at the Broadway Theater. And for his final performance on Broadway in The King and I, we charged the ungodly price of $75. Well, you know, that, that was ungodly back I mean, we, we laugh about it now, but 19, that, that was a lot of money back then. That is an equivalent of about $300 for a, for a ticket now. So it was, you know, even... Was, I have a memory. Yeah. You know, uh, in the 70s, it was the... Uh, I mean, what? the what? 70s, Liza Minnelli in the act, $25 for an orchestra ticket. Can you believe it? I believe, I believe. I, but here's one of the things. Again, we've got to go... One of the nice things about doing this program and being nostalgic about things is that we can say both nice things and speak ill of the dead. So do you have any nice or not nice stories about Yul Brenner? My, my, I only, I only want to talk positive. The, 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 one of the quirks about Mr. Brenner was that before he, we, we were working with him on tour, and before he would move into a city, before he would go into a dressing room, it had to be painted dark brown. That was his color. So we had mobilized forces, and his personal space had to be painted before he arrived in the city, dark brown. I have another memory when we were on Broadway. The yeah. Queen of Thailand came to visit, and of course, the King and I had sat in Thailand. And that became a big deal, uh, making all those arrangements and the entourages and the, the pomp and circumstance. It was fantastic. Oh, Oh, so and you, I thought you were going to say it was just a pain in the butt and not worth the time and effort to do it, but you're saying it was it was kind of great to no, do. It was oh, great! I mean, the Queen of Thailand it was a show about Thailand. Yeah. No, I, it was good. Now here's a speaking of personalities, and again, maybe you'll just have positive and happy stories about this. But at one point, did you represent a concert or something by Frank Sinatra? Uh, yes, I, years ago I worked for Radio City Music Hall. And subsequently, I worked for one of the giants in the PR world, a fellow named Lee Salters. And Sinatra was a client of the office. For many, many years, we re Lee represented um, Sinatra. Any stories, good or bad? Oh, my God, Frank Sinatra stories. Well, that's not a, an account that I was working on, but they shielded us from a lot. But, oh. you know, I, I Frank Sinatra stories. Um, I can't be of help to you there right now. Okay. No. All right. Okay. What about, I, I can, I can go to some other people. Although well, no, I did recently, yeah. here's, here's an amusing thing. Yeah. So his wife Barbara died and I ended up buying a painting that they bought and had in their home from the early forties. It was a picture of, of a movie set and he's in the painting and he starred in the film. Whoa. So that's a new addition to my life. And I'm, Really, you know, it sort of comes full circle a little bit. I'm really happy um, that you know that happened. And, you yeah. know, I kind of adore this painting, the history of it, and the fact that um, you know just what it represents by a guy named Richard Wharf, who was the director of the film that took place in 1945. Wow, that's no, that's pretty. That's pretty. So, so really, it, it's it's gratitude to his widow for dying. That the, 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 <laughs> you have a twisted mind, don't who, you? Who, me? Oh, not at all. Now, speaking of, of twisted, uh, speaking of, of strange and difficult times, you had mentioned before that you as a person and also as a working person in the entertainment field, even before COVID, you dealt with AIDS and also 9-11, particularly for Broadway 9-11. What was it like then? How did Broadway climb out of... This idea that who's going to want to sit in the middle of Manhattan, five miles from, you know, ground zero bombing and come back and do Broadway shows and see Broadway shows. How did you help pull people back into the Broadway world? That and post 9-11 was kind of a, a, a wonderful moment, I think, in the lives of so many New Yorkers. Broadway closed down for two performances. Right. Um, I remember. And then there was this event that took place in Times Square that was organized by the Broadway League. And we pulled together everyone that was in a show, all these great New Yorkers, and everyone got 
together in Duffy Square before the Red Steps, uh, just saying, come to New York, see a Broadway show, we're open for business, come, join us, go to a restaurant, go to a show. And it was a huge success, and that was one of the catalysts that started New York back on, on the trail of, you know, after that horrible moment in, in our world. Yeah. And I think also it helped that the producers was running at, at that point, and people people would pay a hundred dollars, not seventy five, but one hundred and fifty dollars to to the producers. Were like, you know what? Um, if it were any other show, I would probably cancel. I'd stay home. I won't go. I'm scared. But for the producers and Nathan Lane and Matt Brock, you know what? I think I'll go. You know, and I think, absolutely right. Yeah. that was a, a huge. That was the Hamilton of its time, and it, you know, it was a huge cause to lab, and that became a giant magnet. To help bring people back to the theater. You're well, absolutely right. Do you think Hamilton will be able to do that, let's say, in June-ish? Um, you know, I, wouldn't that be great? I think, you know, Hamilton will be one of many shows that, you know, theater people have strong spirits. And uh, we will band together and we will come up with plans and events and, and reasons to bring people back to New York bring people back into the theaters once it's safe to do that. I'm, I'm thinking live sex acts, because that will really be the only thing that would get me there for a while. I'm, I'm, you oh, know. I've been there, done that, no? <laughs> well, we've been there, done that, but I, I could do it again and certainly watch <laughs> at my age. That would be, you know, live sex acts back on 42nd Street, 8th Avenue. It could be 8th Avenue, it could be 7th Avenue. <laughs> Either, even 52nd Street, I'd go that high. to, to see the. Oh my, are you about to tell us an old Calcutta story? That, that, that was simulated. That wasn't, a, a, you know, I'm, Dave, who, who hosts this oh, program, I'm sorry saw old Calcutta. You. What was, sorry? I'm sorry to disappoint you. Wait a minute. You mean old Calcutta had, had actual. Dave doesn't remember that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Rabbi, get with the program. I, I, I guess. <laughs> I'm beyond my own program at this point. But let me, you are a member of ATPAM, right? The, the Association of Theatrical Press Agents. And, I am. And yeah. I'm also a member of the Film Publicity Union. I'm in the oh. PR Union. Oh, I didn't, didn't know that. But as, speaking in terms of, of the theater press agent stuff, you will probably get a little more of the skivvy from the Broadway League and the American Theater Wing. <laughs> right now, they're still supposedly saying that Broadway theaters are closed until April 12th. And they're going to reopen April 13th. There's no, 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 they're not. But they're not wanting to choose a date yet that things will re. What have you? What's the latest thing you've heard? Well, you know, first of all, I think on on a, on a national level, it's already been talked about through the end of April. But I think it's going to be extended. You know, the Tonys have been postponed. Mm -hmm. All the major award shows for the spring have been postponed. Well, there goes my OB. Yeah. Don't know, but it's looking like late spring. Hopefully, maybe I don't know into the summer. We just don't know. I mean, we need to get past this terrible moment in our lives. I mean, the uncertainty of it is 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 very difficult. Um, but one thing that's really interesting is that it's not just about me or you. It's really about us. It's just no. It's about it's, me. Everything is about me. It's showing how connected we really are with. Other. Yeah. Except we can't be connected with each other. The only way to connect is is, is by video at the moment. That's that's, that's isn't the. That the isn't that kind of fascinating? Well, people have You're said that we're very right. lucky that this isn't nineteen like nineteen sixty because there would have been you know all there would have been was four channels on the television set, no internet, no audio books, no Netflix, no no Hulu, no nothing. You just kind of you have to sit there and read all day, which. Uh, no, I did a now, this is before my time, okay. but in 1609, something called the bubonic plague yes. swept the world. And in England, the Globe Theatre, which a guy named Shakespeare was running, Never heard. had King Lear on its stage. And they had to cancel performances of King Lear and close the theatre until the plague was over. So if you go back, what's that, 400 plus years? History repeats itself. It does. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. You know, it's different, of course. This, this is unprecedented in our life and our society. But, you know, things like 
9-11 and things like blackouts and hurricanes have postponed the theater, postponed our lives, but not to the magnitude that we're feeling right now. But yeah, thank God for all these streaming services and uh, the ability for us to stay at home and still be entertained. You know, there's something like what called Broadway HD, where you can see Broadway shows and all Broadway shows in their entirety from your living room. That's right. And the Royal National Theater. I, mean, I cannot tell you how many uh, high school productions of plays and musicals are on YouTube. Well, you can just, just pick any show and you will see either entire productions of them taken with one camera by a parent very far away, you know, with, with the hand shaking. But still, you get an idea. Oh, there, there's Molly Brown up there. That's her. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's stuff that you can certainly entertain yourself with for hours and hours on end. And we're very, in that way, in an isolated way, we're quite, thank God, we're very lucky. Speaking of, you know, of there's, yeah. There's yeah. also something really interesting that God created years ago called the book. No, nah, you know, ugh, oi. And I'm a peep, we're people of the book. And then I, I'm, I'm tired of books. You can actually pick up a book and sit down in a chair and yeah. read. I know. You know, what a blessing is that? It's, it's where we have the time to do that. That's one of the things that we've forgotten about, is that, that suddenly when your day is open to you, you're not working eight hours and, and getting on the subway and schlepping here and going there. It's like, oh, I have an hour where I can just read something. I, I, I choose the Torah. Clean your house up. Um, organize, organize your life a little bit. Get rid of some of the clutter and the crap. Well, actually, here is one of the things. This is a cool question. Since you've worked on so many shows for all these years now, what are some of your favorite pieces of memorabilia that um, you've been able to accumulate in shows that you've represented or shows you've seen or gifts from you know, producers or cast members or something like that? What are things you would never throw out? One of my dearest friends in the world was a guy named Miles White. Uh, Miles was a costume designer, and he designed the original production of Oklahoma and Carousel. Oh. He was the first designer to put a sequin on an elephant working for the circus. And I lived with one of his Tony Awards oh. from a 1955 musical called Bless You Are. Bless Us All, rather. Okay. And I lived with some of the costume sketches from Bye Bye Birdie. <gasps> Whoa. Which on the back has the actual gold LeMay samples from Conrad Birdie's costume. Whoa. So that's pretty cool. That is I have a drawing he did of Ethel Merman in a, in a film called There's No Business Like Show Business. Okay, so let me ask you, do you have enough of this kind of stuff where, now God, God willing, Keith, you will live another 30, 40 years or more, and then you won't get COVID again, you won't get anything again, you'll be very healthy, but are you making provisions like when you and your husband go that this will go to the New York Public Library of Performing Arts or the, the Lawrence Lee Institute, you know, where, where they can... Keep, keep this stuff that has historical significance. Actually, the answer to that is yes and no. I, I operate a second business. I operate an art gallery uh, oh. because we have been collecting American modern art for the three decades we're together and we have too much. So we're actually selling some of it. Um, but every year we give works away to different museums Whoa. because we think it's important to give back. So, yeah. I mean, so some of it, because my belief is that we don't really own this material. We live with it for a while, we kind of rent it. It will outlive us, but we pass it on, you know. We live with it for a while, and then we let it go. I like that. I, like, I mean, I, that's a, a lovely attitude about oh, you're, you're just sharing it for the moment. You're, you're enjoying it, and then, whoop, it's yeah. meant to be to everyone. Yeah, yeah, it's going to outlive all of us, so some of it will give away, some of it will sell, so we can acquire more and live with it for a while and then pass that on, and it just sort of keeps going. Um, for many years, I represented Al Hirschfeld. Oh, the, the uh, cartoonist, the drawer for guy. For the last 15 years of his life, Yeah, and I've represented his foundation since he passed away. And, I mean, there's an artist that you know, captured the, 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 the heart of the 20th century across the board for popular culture, mostly for the theater, but film and, 
and television and music and, and politicians and literary figures. He was just an amazing human being. Huh. Do you have any Al Hirschfeld stories? I remember sitting with him once. Yeah, I mean, I would sit in, with him in his, in his, he lived on 95th Street between Lex and Park, and his studio was on the top floor of this pink townhouse. And, you know, he would do interviews, and the world media giants would come and talk to him. He would, you know, <laughs> some of the things that came out of his mouth were, were just astonishing, because he knew everyone. But he would say, if you live long enough, everything happens. And that was often when he was given some kind of an award or an accolade that sort of came out of left field. He just said, well, I'm living long enough, you know, so. Everything uh, you live long enough, everything happens. Stories about people, you know, just. Well, who are some of the favorite? We're talking with Keith Sherman, the, the longtime publicist and, and veteran press agent. Who are some of the, the favorite people or shows that you have represented? Like your, your most golden moments doing the job that you do. You know, I'm a guy that lives in the moment. So my mm. favorite show is the one I'm working on today. Which is? I can't, I can't, not nothing. Well, I know, I know that. <laughs> a month ago, well, what show were you working on? I've got no clients right now. Yeah. They're all, you know, everything's yeah. either canceled or postponed or, you know, it's irrelevant. But we're all hopeful it's going to come back later in the spring or in the summer. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be optimistic. Right, but, yeah. You know, that things that I don't know about will present themselves. And, you know, I, I work with many great men and women producers who mm -hmm. have a, a dream and a dollar. And, you know, we get their shows on, on, on their feet and feet. Okay. And, you know, we'll be bringing audiences to see them and we'll be entertaining. God and, willing. God. No, think, but, but, you know, you... Know, you... Back, we're going to want great entertainment you know people we're going to want to make and need to make people smile and and to forget about the, the the horrors that we're living through right now god willing god willing but, but you know we want to smile from your experiences in the past so so either what then what what is a show of all the shows you've represented that you there are so many i mean for example i worked on the original production of 42nd street under david Merritt. i didn't whoa i didn't um, know that okay here we go okay and, and yeah that was an amazing experience and just you know the, the the various publicity stunts this was after mr merrick i worked on it beginning in the second or the third year after he had had his stroke oh um but you know his wife was involved but still he was very much involved and you know, handling 18 years of Tony Awards um, mm. was also kind of... All right, well, Keith, Keith, let me stop you right there. Keith, let me, let me, handling 18 years of Tony Awards. Tell people behind the scenes, like, you know, everybody watches it on TV from Radio City or they used to see it from theaters. Um, what is, what goes on behind the scenes at the Tony Awards and how are you involved? Uh, well, my job, was the, the managing the public profile of the Tonys, and I coordinated, I worked for the, uh, at the end of Broadway League and the American Theater Wing, which ran the Tony Awards, and uh, I coordinated with all of the press offices for the Broadway productions and the television network, mm. uh, and journalists from around the world who were interested in the theater who wanted to report on Broadway's best and, you know, the greatest theater award extant. So, there's, there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of politics, you know, on any given year, there's about three dozen-ish productions that are eligible, and that gets whittled down to nominees and dealing with producers and, and directors and writers and actors and designers and coordinating with various offices and, and the television component and right. running a lot of different events. Well, the uh, night of, the Tony Award night, I mean, the, you don't have the journalists sitting in the audience with all the actors and, and the nominees. Where are they and how are they coordinated and all that? Tony Award night usually started at about 8 in the morning uh, where we would have uh, 
the first of two dress rehearsals for wow. the Tony Award. Normally, um, many of the shows would play matinees that day. Some of them didn't, but some of them did. So, in order to rehearse their production number for the cameras, we did a rehearsal early in the morning at around 9, and then one in the mid-afternoon. So, the shows that played matinees, the cast would come in early, early, and run their number for the cameras. Wow. And then at 3 o'clock, we would have another rehearsal for shows that weren't playing matinees. You know, we had a, there was always special material, say an opening number. Right. Uh, presenters would come in and run their short bits. The ladies would hold up oftentimes their dress. So the lighting designers... Can How high would they hold up the dress? Now that I'd like to so, see. Yeah, okay. Well, for color and just, you know, some of them did, some of them didn't. You know, every situation was unique. Uh, people would come in from around the world uh, to present awards. Um, you know, a lot of local people, but, you know, I remember years that Audrey Hepburn came in. Um, that was a big deal for us. You know, it was a who's who of, of, of the entertainment business because many movie stars had gotten their start in the theater. And sure, of course. Times, as you know, people would come back to simply to show up to an award. It, it was an exciting but wildly challenging time managing yeah. the, you know, people's expectations and the demands and, you know, walking a, a, a tightrope often, huh. uh, just keeping everything going forward. And, and I, yeah. loved it. I had a great time. Yeah. Well, did, were you sad when, because cause there's a different agency handling the Tonys now, were, were you sad or was it time to let that go when they changed? Uh, you know, look, yeah. I handled it for 18 years, yeah. which is a pretty long run for anything in life, particularly in the entertainment business. But everyone I started with either died or retired. Hmm. And the new people that came in wanted different people. So that's, you know, I mean, I've been around long enough. That's the way it works, you know. But I had a great run. I loved it. I was sad when it happened. I've come, you know, it's, it's, it's years now. Right. Um, in, in the meantime, I've been handling the Drama Desk Awards. I've been handling the Cheetah Rivera Awards. Um, so it just, life shifts. It's, it's yeah. okay. I'm, 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 I'm a happy person. There's that optimistic uh, tone. Again, and, and it has been a wonderful run talking with you on this program on Dave's Gong Bye. Um, I want to, so here's the deal, in terms of thinking optimistically for the future, if you're thinking in terms of summer and fall, what shows are we expecting you to work on, assuming they don't get canceled? <laughs> well, well, you know, oh my yeah. The truth is, I have no idea. You know, there are shows that I'm not even aware of that. God willing, will be hiring us, and some of the things that we had in the pipeline. I mean, I don't know. Right now, I'm, I'm not on any. I was not on anything currently running on Broadway. Okay. Hopefully, that will change. It may or may not. But there'll be things that come in. I mean, I work in film and music and dance and fine art okay. and television. Um, oh. Okay. So things will present themselves. So I just don't know what they're going to be. Well, I'm sure. God, I mean, no, I'm not. I can't be sure. Nobody can be sure right now. But God willing, things will work out. You will have more shows than you know what to do with, or at the very least, you can volunteer to represent this this uh, this podcast here. We can certainly use the help. God knows, can't really pay you. We can pay you in matzah if that works for you. Let me let me ask you a, a, a quick question. How do lost eggs and onions? <laughs> Even better. I don't know if we, we can't afford locks, but onions we can afford. We'll talk, but. How Jewish are you? I mean, you know, we mentioned you are Jewish. You married a Jewish doctor. But uh, do you celebrate anything when you have... If this were an ordinary year, would you be celebrating Pesach in a week or what? Yeah, with, with my family, absolutely. We do Passover every year. But I'm a cultural Jew. I'm really in it for the food. <laughs> so let me ask, I ask this of everybody, even if they're not Jewish, what is your Hebrew name? Because Keith, I don't know what the hell they get. What is Tuppel. your... What was it? Tuppel. Tuppel? Yeah, oh, I was named after my father's father, oh. who, came in, who came in from the old country, who came in from Russia in the early, you know, the 1910s, 
19, you know, yeah. teens. Well, let me just say, for on behalf of the Dave's Gone By audience and, and for my uh, my Temple Sons of Bitches, now, Keith Sherman, you make a lovely couple, if you know what I'm saying. That's a Jewish joke there. It has been delightful having you on the program. I do wish you, by the way, more than anything else, continued health and your husband, too, because apparently people don't get it over again. It doesn't come back. And, you know, willing, right? and he's a Jewish doctor, so he will help you no matter what. But <laughs> it's been lovely talking with you, health, and then followed by continued success. And we thank you. Thank you, you Rabbi. And thank you, David. Much appreciated. Um, you know, as they said on Star Trek, live long and prosper. Halabai. We should all. And bless you. Bless you from me. Bless you if you sneeze. And shalom to you, couple. Bye bye now. A blessing on your head, Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. Bye bye now. Take care. Oh, we had Keith Sherman on the program. Couple Sherman, ladies and gentlemen, the press person. I wish I could tell you now. Go see this show that he's working on. But fast forward a couple of months, and I bet you will.